what's weird is I remember that. So uh, I've been speaking to young people, uh, mainly young people, for quite some time. And part of that is because of the nature of my ministry that I have been blessed to be a part of. Uh, so I've been in youth and family work for, for a while, and then I was able to serve as a director of youth and culture for a particular publishing entity, and that's where uh, Dale first was introduced to Kayo Magazine. So it was at one time Kayo Magazine, uh, and we would print it, and congregations would subscribe to it, and, and it had a, a good span, I guess, is kind of one of those things. But as everything does in, in business, uh, you better be moving forward because if you sit still, then you're probably going to be left behind. And so what we decided to do when we relaunched that magazine, uh, we relaunched it under Kayo Publications, which is the publishing company, the nonprofit publishing company that my wife Erin and I co-founded in 2012. We relaunched that uh, magazine as a digital magazine, and it's called I Illuminate. And so if you really get bored tonight, uh, you can download the app, I Illuminate Magazine, uh, or you can go to Kyle Publications, and uh, in case you're really curious how that's spelled, K-A-I-O, uh, and what that is, is uh, it's a Greek word uh, that means to be on fire from the inside and burn out. In other words, we sing about being on fire for something, it's the Greek equivalent of that. Uh, so feel free to look that up, you'll find a little bit more about who we are. But Aaron is not able to be here tonight, as well as Michaela, our 16-year-old daughter, and Colton, our 17-year-old son. Uh, Aaron and Michaela are out of town. Colton worked late. So I was privileged to travel tonight with Camden and Bennett. Uh, so we are blessed with four children, and we try our best to be what God would have us to be in our ministry. So we get to travel full-time uh, speaking. We just returned from... Uh, a trip down south and after we finish up here we're going to go out to Texas so we're full-time traveling uh, ministry that's what we do uh, and so it's a unique ministry but it works well uh, for us so we're glad to be with you tonight thank you for inviting me and I appreciate Dale uh, assigning this topic let's go to our father in prayer uh, I'm excited about this one my prayer is as we walk away from it that you will have had a, a great Bible study and a better understanding of forgiveness but I also do want to drive home the point of what's up there because this is a subject that if you're not struggled with it, if you've never struggled with it, chances are you will encounter people in your life who will struggle with this concept of God, if He only knew how bad I was, then there's no way He would forgive me. And you know and I know the reality is this. God already knows all of us and He still forgives. So I'm looking forward to dealing with this. Let's go to our Father in prayer before we get going. Dearly Father, Lord, we do thank you for tonight. We're grateful for the opportunity to be here amongst uh, Christians, amongst individuals who are trying to be who you'd call us to be. And Lord, we, uh, we pray your blessing to be upon our study tonight. Please be with those who were mentioned in the time of the announcements and with the individuals, especially right now, who are at the hospital. Lord, we, we pray that all will go well or all has gone well uh, with that. Lord, thank you for the uh, ability that we have to serve you and it's our prayer that this good congregation will serve you well in her context. Lord, please use her to touch her neighbors, to touch those in this community, uh, to plant your word, plant the seed, and, uh, and to water. Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity to be the, the speaker of the hour tonight. And I pray that, that I will stay out of your way, that this is about you and uh, about your words. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As we begin tonight, I want to introduce you to some individuals uh, on the screen that you may or may not know of, uh, have heard of. Uh, some of you have been up into the mountains of West Virginia, and some of you have only been to Pigeon Forge or Gatlinburg. But either way, whether or not you know the history of West Virginia, or you know the, uh, the, the tourism that exists in Pigeon Forge and Gatlinburg, you probably have heard of the Hatfields and the McCoys. But what I want you to do tonight is, I want you to focus in on one individual within this picture of the Hatfield Bunch. I do find it quite interesting. And of course it is to the, the time period. You'll notice none of them are smiling. This is an actual picture. And they are posing with what would uh, be something that they would have chosen to pose with, which would have been their guns. Which you look at that and go, I can't believe that somebody would have done that. Well, 
it's interesting because people would pose with all kinds of things to relay a message. But when you really dive in to the leader of the Hatfield group, you're introduced to an individual by the name of William Anderson Hatfield. Now, you don't know him as William Anderson Hatfield, but some of you may know him as Devil Ains Hatfield. He's actually the patriarch of the family, and he is the one that's responsible, as you can see on the screen there, on August 7th, Devil Ains' brother Ellison got into a fight with Randall McCoy's son, Tolbert. Well, the problem was Tolbert repeatedly stabbed Ellison, as did his two brothers, Farmer and Rudolph Jr. Well, obviously that didn't set well with Devil Ains Hatfield. So what Devil Ains Hatfield ordered was, he ordered to go to the McCoys and to grab three of the McCoy sons. He tied them up, and the deal was, whatever was going to happen to his brother, that there would be consequences that would come to those three sons. Now the brother ended up dying, and so what happened was, those three boys died at the hands of the Hatfield group, but by order of Devil Ains Hatfield. I will tell you this, he didn't get the name Devil by accident. He earned that reputa in his reputation. Some would say he earned it when he was a young boy, he earned it when he was a teenager. Either way, what I want you to do is as you look at that man, I want you to understand that he was responsible for the death of at least three, and you and I both know that the Hatfield and the McCoy uh, rivalry went well beyond just those three. I want to introduce you to someone else. His name is Jeffrey Dahmer. Now, some of you may know about Jeffrey Dahmer, some of you may not, and due to the nature of, of what he is surrounded with, you are going to have to do some of your own research because I know that there are young children that might hear. But what I do want you to understand is this, that during the period of his uh, crime spree, right? During the period of his crime spree, there would be 17 men and boys that he would have uh, preyed upon. And when I say preyed upon, uh, for those of you who may not remember, there were relationships that were oftentimes had, and then there were uh, meals that were oftentimes had. And if there weren't meals, there were at least preparations for meals, and those meals would have been saved for future meals. So if you know what I'm talking about, there you go. If you don't, I'm sorry, you're going to have to ask your parents or your grandparents. Either way, I want you to look into his eyes, and I want you to see him. I want you to understand something about these two men, Devil Ains Hatfield and Jeffrey Dahmer. And here's what I want you to understand. History will record that both of these are your brothers in Christ. Now as weird as that sounds, and as unnerving as that sounds, William Ains Hatfield, in the later part of his life, would be baptized for the remission of his sins by a traveling preacher that was well known to teach what the Lord's church taught. As a matter of fact, it is said by those who are of the Hatfield group that still exist to this day that there was a congregation started up in West Virginia by Devil Ains Hatfield in the early 1920s before he'd passed away, or the 1910s. Of Jeffrey Dahmer, it's quite interesting because I wanted to make sure of this and I went back. I don't know how many of you have ever heard of Phil Sanders before. Phil Sanders is the speaker on In Search of the Lord's Way, broadcasted out of Oklahoma City. Phil Sanders' uncle is the one that actually had contact with Jeffrey Dahmer after he was sentenced to his term in prison. And uh, this uncle sent Jeffrey Dahmer some information. Jeffrey Dahmer studied that information, reached out, and they in turn reached back out to a minister in the, Oak, or in the Wisconsin area uh, by the name of Roy Ratliff, I believe is his name. Roy Ratliff is a minister in the Churches of Christ. He went, he studied with Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeffrey Dahmer was immersed for the forgiveness of his sins while in prison. And of course, here's what Roy would say. I looked this up today. I actually took a screenshot of his quote because I thought it was quite interesting. He said, everyone wants to know, did his baptism take? That's what Roy has had to, he failed questions on that. It was interesting that Roy would say one of the last times that he actually studied with Jeffrey Dahmer is when he was leaving, Jeffrey Dahmer asked a question. He said, do you, do you, he said this, he says, 
I should have died, I should have been put to death by the state for my crimes. To which Roy looked back at him and said, yes, you should have. In which Jeffrey Dahmer then said, then am I sinning against God by still being alive? Roy said, you picked a fine time to ask this question. He was literally being escorted out of the facility. He turned back to Jeffrey Dahmer and said, I want you to read Romans chapter 13, the first portion of that, which deals with the role of government. He said, I want you to read that because that has a lot to do with your question. Now you know the end result of that. Jeffrey Dahmer was later beaten by inmates. Uh, kind of a, They practiced their own justice and he lost his life in jail. I think it's quite interesting though when you and I consider these individuals, oftentimes we look at them as horrendous people. And their crimes against humanity were horrendous. But in our dealing with the question of, of tonight or the statement, God can forgive any sin, my question is this, has God ever forgiven people who committed horrendous crimes? Has God ever committed or, or forgiven individuals who, who actually were responsible for murdering individuals for hatred? Who were responsible for tearing up families and, and doing so full well with knowledge of what they were doing? Has God ever dealt with individuals who, who didn't deserve forgiveness? You see, when you think back about Devil Ains Hatfield and you think back about Jeffrey Dahmer, one of the reasons that we struggle with can God forgive any sin or God can forgive any sin is because we look at those crimes against humanity and we say there is no way, there is no way God can, can forgive that or what we'll say is this, I question that person's sincerity. Now, oftentimes what we do when we ask those questions is we put ourselves in the position of God. And what I want you to understand tonight is this. God doesn't wait on your permission to forgive someone. He doesn't wait on your approval to forgive someone. As a matter of fact, He went against the approval of quite a few people in the, the New Testament when Jesus would deal with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. When He would deal with individuals who were, who were paralytic and yet He would forgive their sins. When He would go sit at the house of tax collectors and sinners, and, and yet he would make the bold statement that those who believe they're righteous, they don't need a, a physician, but those who are sick, those are the ones that he came to seek after. You see, when you think about individuals in the past, uh, through the Old Testament, humanity has always struggled with this concept of, if I can't envision God being able to forgive them, then God must be limited to what my comprehension is. And what I want you to understand tonight is this. There's not a single person in this room nor a single person who will watch this video that really wants God to operate that way. As a matter of fact, we really don't want justice. When it really comes down to it, we look at that and we say, Devil Ains Hatfield ought to be hung by the neck. And we look at that and say, some might say Jeffrey Dahmer probably got what he deserved. The reality is this, not a single person in this room wants to operate on justice. Because think about it. If you got justice from God, not a single person in this room would go to heaven. Because justice demands consequence and payment. And the reality is this, when, when God sent Jesus to die on the cross for our sins, that wasn't fair to Him, nor was that just to Him. So forgiveness at its core is not fair. That's what we've got to understand right out of the gate. That's why when we turn to passages like 1 Corinthians Chapter 6, we read about individuals who were in the church and it was said of this, or do, they not, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. The reality is, that these folks in Corinth, they were not what we would say good upstanding Christians at one point in time in their life. They all had a past. And it was an ugly past. And some of their past, quite frankly, some of us would look at that and we would say, there's no way that you could come out of it. And when I say we, I'm being generic. I'm not being specific to us or to you. I'm being generic to, uh, to people. We would look at these and we would say, there's no way. If God only knew what they did... And what I want you to know is this, God 
did know what they did. And that's why there's that next word. He tells them, such were some of you. In other words, he identifies. Some of you brethren in Corinth used to live this way. But then there's that word, but. And that word means everything. (coughs) Excuse me. In other words, he says, that's not who you are now. Because something changed. Tonight, what I want us to do in our time of study is I want us to answer two questions. Two questions that I firmly believe as we leave today will will help us. And if there's time, at the very end, what I want to deal with is what we normally look at as, well, that's the unpardonable sin. There's one in the Bible that says they will never have forgiveness. I mean, after all, if God can forgive any sin then Joe, we've got to deal with the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, there's no way to get around that. And so what I want you to know tonight is this, that we can deal with that. And we can deal with it honestly without having to do any spiritual gymnastics to get around anything. But what I want you to understand, obviously, is is tonight are two concepts. And that's this. How can God forgive sins? All sins. And the next question is, why? Why would God forgive all sins? And so for that study, what I want us to do is I want us to open our Bibles to the book of Ephesians. And I want us to take a a, a glimpse, a look, into how God deals with people from the standpoint of how does He end up having that forgiveness. And where I want us to begin tonight, and you may want to take notes on this, write this down, is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Because in Ephesians 4, 32, there is a bold proclamation and statement that is made where it says this, Be kind to one another tender-hearted, forgiving each other just as God, and here's the how, in Christ also has forgiven you. That phrase, in Christ, is the answer for all of us. It, you already know that. My prayer is that, that maybe in your dealing with other people that you'll be able to, to clearly take them to a passage of Scripture and show them, how can God forgive me? How can God forgive murderers? How can God forgive homosexuals? How can God forgive adulterers? How can God forgive thieves? You go down the list. And here's the answer. In Christ. That's where you and I find forgiveness. That's why those of us who are Christians, when we have studied it out, we've listened to those lessons, we've studied it on our own account, we came to the conclusion that in Christ I have blessing, but outside of Christ I do not have the blessing. That comes with being in covenant with God. Now, I want you to do something for me. I want you to turn back to Ephesians chapter 1. The book of Ephesians can actually be divided up into two main sections. It's Ephesians chapter 1, 2, and 3, and then Ephesians chapter 4, 5, and 6. Uh, And it's actually quite easy how that division occurs. And I want to show you this, because in chapters 1, 2, and 3, he deals with what is called the one new man. And that one new man comes out at verse 15 where the Bible says, By abolishing in his flesh the enmity which is in the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. Well, who is he talking about? Ultimately, he's talking about Jews and Gentiles. He's talking about individuals who were not covenant people of God and individuals who were covenant people of God according to the Old Testament. And what he's saying is this, and he'll go through the line, he'll tell them, verse 11, Remember therefore that, uh, that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And then here's that phrase again. But now, I love the way the Scriptures do this. The Apostle Paul, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he paints a contrast. And he paints it in the sense that they will remember where they've come from, but then he will throw in, but now. In other words, things are different. He did it up in chapter uh, 2, verse 3 and 4 again, right? He says in verse 3, Among them we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But look at the first word of verse 4. But God. In other words, the book of Ephesians is filled with drawing contrast. And he'll do that later on. He'll say, this is how the Gentiles walked, but I want you to walk like Christ walks. 
This is how the, the individuals who are sons of the night walk or sons of disobedience, but you are sons of light. This is how I want you to live. And the, the book of Ephesians draws a stark contrast, which is not uncommon with that culture. But sometimes, you know, we live in America, which is, we love to talk about, well, there's just some gray areas and we're going to have to agree to disagree. Well, I will admit that there's some room for agreement and disagreement. In other words, if somebody wanted to tear up this carpet and put in hardwood floor and somebody else wanted to keep the carpet, then you know what? We're not going to reach the same conclusion. And that's okay, right? That's okay. We shouldn't split over it. But when it comes to the idea of God says do this, man says do that, there's no room to agree to disagree. Do you understand? Because that's called speaking in subjectivity. There's a difference between objectivity and subjectivity. Subjectivity deals with subjective truth. Subjective truth is what you want it to be and whatever I want it to be because it's based upon our interpretation. It looks like this. Two people go into the same movie, see the same movie at the exact same time. Maybe it's about this guy who loved a girl, but he didn't express his love to the girl, and he died, but before he died, he put a message in a bottle, threw it out in the ocean. The woman's walking out on the beach because... Uh, he's now dead and she's kind of, you know, grieving and the bottle washes up and she pulls the note out and says, oh, he finally loved me, right? He expressed it to me, right? So two people go see the same movie. One person walks out sobbing and says, that was the best movie I've ever seen. Another person walks out sobbing and says, I can't believe I wasted $50 on that movie, right? Now here's the deal. One of them said it was the best movie they'd ever seen. Another one said it was the worst movie they'd ever seen. Can they both be right at the same time? Shake your head like this. Because it's totally up to the individual subjectively. Objective truth says this. I walk into this building and I say, this building exists. Somebody else walks into the building and says, this building does not exist. Whether the building exists or not is not based upon my thoughts or my feelings. It's not even based upon whether or not I close my eyes and just pretend like the building doesn't exist. The building exists as an objective concept outside of me and outside of the other person. Either the building exists or it doesn't. But it cannot both exist and not exist at the same time. Do you understand the difference between subjectivity and objectivity? Here's the deal. The book of Ephesians does not deal with subjectivity. The Apostle Paul, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, when he would write, he dealt with objective facts. He says, this is who you used to be but God. Don't forget, Gentiles, this is who you used to be, but now in Christ Jesus. So the first three chapters is a very matter-of-fact statement of what God did through Jesus Christ. He, is, he brought the two separates into one new man. Now the other half of the book of Ephesians, chapters 4, 5, and 6, deal with how does that one new man exist. And so here's where that comes into play, chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore, which if, you're, if, if you make notations in your Bible, you need to write down every time the word implore or beseech or urge shows up in your English, standard, or in your English translations. And here's why. It's a Greek word that, that really puts the emphasis on what the author wants to drive home. It's called a parakaleo word. Okay? That word drives home. So anytime you see the words implore, beseech, or urge, that is, if I don't hear anything else, I need to tune in to this, right? Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling. That word walk will not only occur in chapter 4, verse 1, it occurs in chapter 4, verse 17, chapter 5, verse 2, chapter 5, verse 8, chapter 5, verse 15, and it actually occurs before that in chapter 2, verse 10. Chapter 2, verse 2. So here's the deal. The concept is this. You used to walk one way, but because Christ came and something was different, now you walk a different way. So why do I address all of that? I address all of that because we learned in chapter 4 that in Christ, that's where we find forgiveness. But I want you to understand this at a deeper level. I want you to go back to chapter 1. And there are three words that I've highlighted. You can see in my text, I want you, if you take notes, then I would highly encourage you to, to write these down. Here you go. Chapter four or chapter 1, verse 4, the word chose. 
Chapter 1, verse 5, the word adoption. Chapter 1, verse 7, the word redemption. Here's why. In Christ, or through Christ, or through Him, is found numerous times in chapter 1. As a matter of fact, it's found in chapter 1, verse 3, chapter 1, verse 4, chapter 1, verse 5, chapter 1, verse 7, chapter 1, verse 10 on two occasions, or depending on where your translators split it, chapter 1, verse 11 as well. Chapter 1, verse 13 as well. Now why would I bring that up? I bring that up because obviously God through Christ Jesus forgave us. It would make sense that if the Apostle Paul is going to make that statement in chapter 4, that he would have already laid the foundation for that statement earlier on. And here's what we find out. Chapter 1 is filled with the concept of in Christ you have this. In Christ you have that. Now there's a lot that is said there. One of the key things that Calvinism uh, tries to to hijack is the concept of predestination. Beginning with verse 3 of chapter 1, it reads this way, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Notice where the spiritual blessings are found in the heavenly places, but it's found in Christ. Verse 4, Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him in love, He predestined us to adoptions as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself according to the kind intention of His will. And here's why I say this. Calvinism loves to hijack that and say, See there? He individually predestined, He individually chose people to either go to, to go to heaven. And what I want you to know is this, that the Apostle Paul was not inspired by the Holy Spirit to write something that contradicts what we find in simpler passages in the New Testament. So in other words, uh, when, we, when we quote, when we read John chapter 3, verse 16 and following, "...for God so loved only those whom He predestined to go to heaven, that He gave His only begotten Son." that only those who are predestined to go to heaven would believe in Him, uh, they would not perish, but they would have everlasting life. And you and I both know, is that how John 3.16 sounds? No, it's not. For God so loved the what? The world. The world is all-encompassing. So in other words, God's love is not only for individuals that, according to what Calvinism would love to make this passage say, were predestined to go to heaven. The idea is this. God sent Jesus to die for everyone. Well, that would make no sense if he had already predetermined some to go to hell. I mean, think about that pointless death. Or, or what is written, that, that God is not willing that only those whom he predestined to go to heaven would perish, uh, but they would come to repentance, right? He's, he's not willing that how many? Any, right? God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. The idea is this. You and I both know, I don't need to to beat this horse. The idea is there's plenty of passages in the New Testament where we could turn to find that God sent Jesus to die for all, that the gospel message is for all, and if we were to believe what Calvinism teaches, which is He predestined some to go to heaven and some to go to hell, then we've got a problem with those concepts of all-encompassing nature, right? So here's what I'm going to take for granted. I'm going to take for granted that you understand the more simple concepts in the Scriptures cannot be contradicted by what we find here. So the question is, well, what do we find here? And the easy answer is this, because I don't have time to unwrap all of it. Here's the easy answer. The Gospel is for all. All will, who will obey the Gospel, all who faithfully submit to God and enter into covenant with Him through the blood of His Son Jesus, which is through baptism for the remission of sin, all of those will be added to the church and be in covenant, thus have forgiveness of their sins. Now that's the basis, right? Here's what I want you to know about the in Him. The answer, the how. Here's the how. I told you three words. Chose, adoption, and redemption. And I need you to think of these words not in terms of Americans. I'm going to ask you to go back to ancient Ephesus in your mind. I'm going to ask you to think about a time and a culture that wasn't ours. They didn't have the same laws. They didn't have the same customs, and they didn't have the same practices. So here you go. In ancient Ephesus, it was actually a wealthy place. You can, you can get online right now and see archaeological dig sites that are going on where they would have beautiful mosaic tiles in some of their homes. 
As a matter of fact, in Ephesus, they used the technology that we know as swamp coolers or geothermal cooling in their time period because they've discovered that there were under, underground tunnels that they would send water through. Now, you and I both know that at a certain depth underneath the Earth's surface, it is a consistent cooler temperature, right? Some of you may watch shows on Discovery or whatever. You're like, hey, he wanted to build a greenhouse or he wanted to build a storage shell, uh, cellar. And so what they did is, since it was in the desert, they dug down so many feet because underneath there, it's like a consistent 55 degrees or something like that, right? So here's the deal. Underneath the ground in Ephesus, they had tunnels and they sent water through it. Well, guess what would happen in the areas where they had wealthy individuals? They would allow openings of those tunnels. So the water at some point in time would be shown in the home flowing at that depth. And here's the deal. As air passed over cold water, it picks up the moisture and blows it through the house, thus cooling the house. It's called a swamp cooler. If you've ever gone to a Bible camp that had a swamp cooler, you know how grateful you are for swamp coolers, right? It's a beautiful thing. But here's what I do want you to know. While there were a lot of what I would say advancements at that time in Ephesus, there were a lot of things that we would say were not great, at least from an American concept. And here's one of them. In that time period when a, a, a husband and a wife or man and woman uh, had a child, the child, whether or not that child stayed within the home, was up to the father. It wasn't up to the mother. They were, it was a different culture. And so the mother would have to come and present the baby to the father. If the father rejected the child, then the child didn't stay in the home. If the father accepted the child, then the child stayed in the home. And They might reject children for various reasons. Mind you, they didn't have ultrasounds. Uh, so any type of uh, mutation or uh, any type of maybe a, a special needs that that father says, I don't want to deal with it. Uh, there were any number of reasons without there being consequences. And so here's the deal. It's my understanding through the studies that they would actually have a place to discard those children. Now you and I would look at that and say that's horrible. In America, we can at least take them to a safe spot, a drop spot. You could take them to a fire station, right? I don't know. I, I do know that not long ago there was a story about a parent who tried to drop their teenager off at a fire station and she got, the parent got in trouble for that, right? There is limitations in America. Um, something along the lines of the teenager doesn't want to follow my rules so I'm kicking her out and the police said no you can't do that you know but you and I both know there are safe spaces to drop children in America there's adoption in Ephesus that was not the case so it has been said before that you could actually walk through the marketplace in Ephesus and out beyond the city streets out in the wilderness you could hear children exposed to the elements who were crying out or were dying now here's what's interesting. When you and I hear the word, He chose us, we hear one thing. But when ancient Ephesus would have heard that concept, here's what you could do with those children. You could have done it, I could have done it. You could walk out to the discard pile and take a child and raise that child in your home. You could raise that child as your slave, or you could raise that child as a son or a daughter. Either way, you, you were the one that got to choose how to raise that child and what position that child would have in your home. So when the Bible says, He chose us, the concept behind that is this. Your sin and my sin put us on the discard pile. He is the one that chose us off of that. Now, what's beautiful about that is God's the one doing the work. Right? Now, here's the other concept, though, is this. The word adoption. That word adoption means this, that when He chose you off the discard pile, He didn't bring you in His home as a slave. As a matter of fact, you and I can look over at chapter 2, verse 19, where the Apostle Paul would tell them that their new identity in Christ, he says, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. You ever heard about the church being the family of God? You ever heard a concept of that we are His household? That means this, when you were forgiven, you weren't forgiven and then made a slave. As a matter of fact, here's the way this works. You choose to serve your father. You see, that's the difference, right? When someone's forced into slavery, that's against their will. 
you and I as children of God being, being adopted into His household, we choose to serve Him. It's kind of that idea that as our kids grow, we want them to do what is right, not because we told them it was right, but because it's right. right? So when, when the father says, go clean your room, the child doesn't stomp up the stairs and, you know, can't believe my dad. The idea is he goes up and he does it because he knows it's right and he knows it's honoring. Right? Now, I hate to say this, but some Christians are stuck in the begrudging uh, growth period of their Christianity. In other words, oh boy, here we go again. Preacher saying we need to serve our neighbors. Preacher saying we need to door knock. Preacher saying we need to have Bible studies. You know what? I just, you know, he needs to get out and do all that. You ever heard that happen before within siblings? Hey, dad said we need to go do this. Or, hey, look, dad may not have said it, but look, I know this needs done. You know, that, he's always trying to tell me what to do. Sometimes bad attitudes can impact spiritual maturity. So the idea is this. Number one, we're chosen. Not individually, but chosen in the gospel. We're adopted, but I want you to hear that next word. That is redeemed. You and I understand what that means. There was a price that was paid for us. But I also want you to understand in Ephesus, if I turn over to chapter 6, I learn in verse 5, Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ. Here's what I learned. I learned Ephesus had slaves. A different culture. Different time. In either case, when you walk through the marketplace in Ephesus, you would have come to a place where they were buying and selling human beings. And there would have been a slave block, and there would have been a slave auctioneer, Asking for a price, people would have been looking uh, over the individual who was the, the person that they were going to buy. Where, is this a strong individual? Does she look like she's going to live a long time? Or is she old and frail? Is it a child? And am I going to you know, have to put the time into raising that child up? And Here's what happened. Your sin and my sin put us on the slave block. And what's beautiful about this scenario, what ancient Ephesus would have heard, is that God walks into that scene... And he says, I'll buy him, I'll buy her. The slave auctioneer says, you don't want them. According to Romans chapter 5, they are your enemies. They were sinful. They were helpless. They were without hope. According to what was written even in the book of Ephesians, they were walking as sons of darkness. And God says this, I'll pay full asking price. You'll pay what? Nobody else is even bidding on them. What's interesting is full asking price at that time was 30 pieces of silver. Isn't it ironic that Judas betrayed Jesus for how much? 30 pieces of silver. But here's what God says. I'll pay beyond asking price. I'll pay with the blood of my son. So how does he? He does so through Christ or in Christ. And what is the concept there? It's that we're chosen, we're adopted, and we're redeemed. And here's what's beautiful. He doesn't stop to quantify how much sin is in somebody's life before he will choose, before he will adopt, and before he will redeem. As a matter of fact, over in Ephesians chapter 2, the Bible says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. So he takes individuals who are dead and he makes them alive. He takes individuals who were strangers and aliens and he makes them part of the family. He takes individuals who had no hope and He gives them hope. He takes individuals who were without a claim to being a, a part of the family and He says, look, you're no longer that anymore. You have claim within the family. What's beautiful about what we read in the book of Ephesians is He really does put into practice what this parable teaches. Now, I want you to look over in your Bible to Matthew chapter 18. Because what you're going to find is a, a familiar concept but it's a concept that I need to point out one thing. Obviously, the unmerciful servant speaks to you and I in the sense of if we're not going to forgive, then we better be ready to reap the consequences of that. But tonight's lesson is not about you and I needing to forgive. I, I want you to understand this. That is a great message. That if you expect the forgiveness of God, 
and you expect Him to forgive you of your sins, you better be ready like a racehorse coming out of that gate to forgive somebody. Some of us are holding on to some baggage and some hurt that we've been holding on to for a long time. And what I'm telling you is this, if God forgave the way we forgave, how would that look in your life? Now, obviously, I know what you're saying. Well, you know what? That individual hasn't repented. That individual hasn't asked for forgiveness. And if God forgave like I forgave, or if I'm supposed to forgive like God forgives, then He's going to wait until that person seeks forgiveness. And so here's what I want you to understand. You're absolutely right in saying that. But I also want you to know this. There are some individuals who have wronged you in your past that are probably already dead. I've been preaching long enough to know that when I look in the eyes of individuals in the audience, there were some bad things that occurred to some people in their childhoods. And guess what? That man is not alive to seek your forgiveness. And so here's the deal. Call it a play on words. Call it what you will. The reality is this. If you're holding on to the weight of that, it's not hurting the individual who's dead. It's hurting you. Now, for what that's worth, I'll just throw that out there. Here's what I do want to say. When Jesus was dying on the cross, last I checked, He said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. That was His plea. I know that we see individuals who would call out to God for healing physically, but yet He would turn around and say, Your sins are forgiven. The right answer would have been this. But I didn't ask for my sins to be forgiven. I asked for you to heal my paralytic leg. Now Jesus did that in that moment, Matthew chapter 9, for a purpose for those who were looking on. And I know that. Please don't come up afterwards and say, but yeah, but that was a unique case for that time. I know that. What I'm offering to you is this. I, we do have biblical times where He said, your sins are forgiven, but that person laying there wasn't saying, hey, Jesus, forgive my sins. Now, the good news is that God knows the hearts of people. You and I don't know the hearts of people, right? So here's what I want you to know from the parable of the unmerciful servant. What I want you to know is this, very simply, that the king went far above and beyond what he had to. Just like the father and the prodigal son went far above and beyond what he had to. Because I want you, if you're listening to this tonight online, if those of you here are wondering if God really knew what I did, would He be able? Would He forgive me? And what I want you to hear is this. God has already demonstrated that He's gone far above and beyond what you think when it comes to forgiveness. So here's what I want us to understand. Matthew chapter 18, verses uh, 23 and following. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he had begun to settle them, one who owed... Him 10,000 talents was brought to him, but since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children, and that he had and repayment be made. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. And the Lord of that slave felt, here's what the New American Standard says, compassion. In the book of Matthew, the word compassion occurs in chapter 9, verse 36, chapter 14, verse 14, chapter 15, verse 32, 18, 27, and 20, 34. And here's what's beautiful about that word. The word compassion doesn't simply mean pity. The word compassion means this, a personal joining with in the emotional struggle of whatever is disturbing. And compassion, not only is an emotional joining with, it is a step in the direction to relieve whatever is causing the problem. Now here's what's beautiful. Over and over again, the reason Jesus responds in the New Testament the way that He does is a demonstration of He had compassion on people. How can God forgive? How can God go above and beyond? It's because of compassion. You and I serve a God of compassion. And I'll tell you this, that makes all the difference. Question number two, real quick, is why? 
Why would God do that? If, he, if the how is in Christ Jesus, where we find choosing, adoption, and redemption, based upon the concept of compassion, my question then is why, right? Here's the, here's the big issue. Why would God forgive Jeffrey Dahmer? Why would God forgive Devil Ains Hatfield? Why would God forgive the thief on the cross? Why would God forgive Saul, who would later become the Apostle Paul, who held the coats while Stephen was stoned to death? Why would God forgive David of the sin of adultery and then of murder? Why would He do that? And here's why. Because of who God is. Do you understand? Sometimes we elevate certain aspects of God above others. And sometimes the reason we do that is because we want to drive home a particular point. And I understand that. There's no running away from any aspect of who God is. God can be full love and full wrath at the same time. You and I struggle with that because our world tells us either He's all love or He's all wrath, but I don't understand how He can be both. Here's the deal. A father can love his child, but still discipline his child. A mother can love her child, but still discipline her child. And according to the text, and look, if you ever lived in the days of whoopings and not spankings, you understand this. Not all discipline feels good, amen? But here's what the Scripture says, that discipline is for our good. So there were times growing up, I know my dad would whoop us, and then he would go cry. And there are times that I have disciplined my children and then your heart breaks. It's not because you don't love them. It's because you do love them. Try to explain that to a child who doesn't understand and they won't ever get it. But you know what? A parent who raises a child and that child is obedient to the laws of the land and treats his wife the way that a husband should treat his wife and raises the children the way that he should raise his children. A father looks back at that. A mother looks back at that and says... It was worth it. It wasn't easy, but it was worth it. Here's what I want you to know. God's nature is why He can forgive any sin. And then the book of Exodus, you see it on the screen before you. Exodus chapter 34. This is a book that was dealing with some pretty, I would call them cantankerous people. Individuals who were a handful. Individuals that if you gave them food, they would say it didn't taste good. Where's the salt? Individuals, if they said you're, they're thirsty and you gave them water, they would say, water? Where's the lemonade? Right? I mean, that's who we're dealing with in the book of Exodus with the children of Israel. Over and over again, there's frustration. Over and over again, there's difficulty. But here's what we land on when it comes to the nature of God. Exodus chapter 34 Verses 6 and 7, describing who God is. The Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression and sin. Yet he will by no means... Leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. Here's what I want us to understand as we come to a conclusion tonight. The nature of God is the why. Why is it that He could, he could demand consequence for sin and then yet send His Son as the payment of that consequence? Why is it that individuals who did Him wrong Throughout the Old Testament, He doesn't turn from as long as they keep crying out to Him. Why is it that even when they, they were the, the adulterers with other nations, why is it that God would have remained and did remain consistent, ready to receive them back, like a husband who was married to a prostitute who cheated on Him? Why is it in the New Testament, individuals who would deny Jesus, Find forgiveness from Jesus. You see, because God is not like man. And over and over again, that's displayed because if God were like man, then forgiveness would not even be an option. Because if God were like man, He would want somebody to pay. If God were like man, 
there would have to be consequences. If God were like, man, look here, we're bringing that up 15 years from now, and just when he starts talking about that such a way, I'm going to say, well, 15 years ago, you did this. And you know what he's going to do? He's going to look back and say, well, you're just like your mom. And she's going to say, and you're just like your dad. And you know what's going to happen is? Words are going to continue to cut. Old baggage is going to continue to be brought back up. You know how I know that? Because I've counseled too many people to know that the number one breakdown of marriage is oftentimes communication. Because there's unresolved conflict in the past. The reality is this, folks. If God were like man, He would keep a list and a record of all the things that we've done wrong, and He would bring them up when it was most advantageous to Him. Here's the good news about God. God is not like you and I. So how can He? In Christ. Why does He? Because of His nature. That's why when I show you these two pictures, I need you to understand there are going to be some people in heaven that on this earth did some really bad things. And then there are going to be some people in hell that did some really good things on this earth too. Because here's what's beautiful. What's beautiful is that whether or not God forgives is not based upon what other people think and how good you were. Because none of us are good when it comes to deserving God's forgiveness. That's why I show you this picture. Because my question is tonight, can you picture yourself in the same company with those two men? If you can't, then there's something about God's forgiveness that you're missing. Now here's what I want to say about the, what we call the unpardonable sin. Over in Mark chapter 3, we find verse 28 and 29. Truly I say to you, all sin shall be forgiven, the sons of men. And whatever blasphemes, excuse me, blasphemies they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. And what we've learned and what we've heard all along was that the sin of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is the only unpardonable sin. Well, here's what I want you to know. Because I heard this too, and growing up it was kind of difficult to bring these two concepts together. Any sin I commit can be forgiven as long as I repent and come back to God. But there's a sin that I cannot be forgiven of, and that is blaspheming, speaking meaninglessly, denying the Holy Spirit. Now why, why can I, on one hand, be forgiven of anything, but on the other hand, not be forgiven of that? And here's the conclusion. In the context of Mark chapter 3, you have miracles that have been done and seen. And yet what you find are the religious elite are coming up to Jesus and saying that He is of Beelzebub. Verse 23, actually 22, the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. He cast out demons by the ruler of the demons. And He called them to Himself and began speaking to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. If Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but he is finished. If that's the context of whoever blasphemes the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Now here's what blaspheme the Holy Spirit meant in context. What it meant was this. You saw the very work of God. You saw the work of the Spirit in these miracles. And yet you are denying the work of the Spirit and you are denying the work of God and ascribing the benefit of the miracle to Satan. That is an outright heart's problem. The heart problem there is this. You can see the goodness of God and yet still deny the goodness of God, and beyond that, ascribe it to Satan. 
That's what it means to blaspheme the Holy Spirit within the context of Mark chapter 3. So the question today is this, can you and I blaspheme the Holy Spirit today? Well, we don't have biblical miracles, so it's not like I can see the miracle and yet turn around and deny the work of God in the miracle. So I can't blaspheme the Holy Spirit the same way they were, but can I blaspheme the Holy Spirit? The answer is yes, because according to the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is the one who inspired the writers of the book of the New, of the New Testament, right? The books of the New Testament. So the way that I would blaspheme the Holy Spirit today is to deny the work of the Spirit that is demonstrated in the Christian age. In other words, if I walk away and I say, you know what, it's a book, it's just written by men, no inspiration by God, I'm going to walk away, I don't care about that. As a matter of fact, you know what, those men were just controlling men. Religion is just a controlling concept. They're trying, and the idea is this, if someone dies with that disposition, then there's no forgiveness. Now here is the good part about that, right? Somebody who takes that view can still come back and change and repent. So really, the only unforgivable sin today is the one that's not repented of. That really is the basis of that. That's why those two concepts are not at odds with one another. They really are jailed quite nicely together. The deal is this. Somebody who's going to see the miracles of God and yet deny God's work and ascribe it to Satan... They've got a heart issue. The same person who, who knows that they're just living any way they want and doesn't turn to God in faithful submission to His Word, they also have a heart issue. Callousness is what the Apostle Paul called it over in the book of Ephesians. Their heart has become calloused. Just like some of our feet. Come on, be real. You know what a callous looks like. Somebody's heart can have that same condition. And as long as that it remains, then that forgiveness is not there. So, can God forgive any sin? Absolutely. Can God forgive adultery? Yes. Can God forgive murder? Yes. Can God forgive homosexual uh, act, act, activity? Yes. Now, here's what I want you also to know. When Jeffrey Dahmer was forgiven of his sins, the prison didn't release him he still had to pay the consequences. When those who were the adulterers are forgiven by God, that doesn't release them from the consequences of that adultery in this life. When individuals who are murderers, it doesn't release them. Homosexuals, the reality is this, they were living in fornication. God is the only one who can join people in marriage no matter what the state says. Yep, that just went out on the internet. But the reality is this, fornication can be forgiven. So what I want you to hear tonight is this. Can God forgive sins? Yes. And since God can forgive any sin, He can forgive your sins as well. He can forgive my sins. And that's the great news of the gospel. And so tonight, what I want you to walk away from, from this lesson is this. You will, never far, you will never fall far enough out of His reach that He cannot redeem you. The only way that happens is if you have a rebellious, calloused heart. Now, for what that's worth, Romans chapter 6 says this, as the Apostle Paul was driving that home, shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? He said, may it never be. In other words, knowing what God is capable of and trying to take advantage of that in your life already reveals where your heart is. And God's not going to forgive that heart. It's the idea of this. Well, I'll do it now and ask for forgiveness later. you got to understand, if that's the heart set, there's a problem. That's where genuine repentance comes into play. And so tonight, what I want to offer to you is this. I want to offer you, if you're here tonight and need this, an opportunity to, to repent. If He can forgive any sins, He can forgive yours. And that's the great news of the gospel. So tonight... Maybe you're here, you've already obeyed the gospel, but maybe you've fallen away. Maybe there's been a heart problem. Tonight's the night to change that. Our God is compassionate, and He's ready to respond to you. If you've never obeyed the gospel, I want to encourage you to do that as well. Just like on the day of Pentecost, individuals wanted to know what